with expert load tester and president of FTL Metrics, Mike Punsky, and we are ready to get started. First, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. This class is being recorded, so you will receive an email from GoToWebinar with the recording in about um, two hours or so uh, after the session. Uh, next, uh, please, um, so we don't have a handout today, but please add your questions to the questions box on the right-hand panel. We will answer them throughout the class and at the end. And then after the class, please answer the questions in the survey. We really appreciate your feedback. Next, I would like to talk about our upcoming user conference, Smart Bear Connect, um, September 12th um, day one will consist of live interactive product classes, and day two will feature unique insights from SmartBear customers and industry experts. We are very excited about this conference um, because it is our very first one. And you can learn more about the conference uh, from the link at the bottom of the page. I will also put a link in the chat box. Next, I would like to go over um, a few of the load complete training resources. So, um, first we have load complete 101, which is we hold it once a quarter. That's your getting started topics. I'm sure a lot of you have already attended the 101 class. Next, we have 201 and 301. 301 is what you're in now, and those are advanced load testing topics. Uh, so, Please, um, you know, after you attend this class, if you have attended all three classes, you will receive a graduate certificate via email. And then next we have, um, you know, our premium training with FTL Metrics, um, hourly consulting, which is load performance testing, load complete mentoring, and alert site consulting services. So great things to take advantage of there. All right, so with me today in the studio, or on the line, um, is expert load tester and president of FTL Metrics, Mike Punsky, and he's going to be running the technical content of the webinar, and me, um, I'm here at Smart Bear in customer marketing, and I will be running the more logistical side of the webinar. If you have any questions about Smart Bear Academy, you can ask me. Um, and then... Mike, I'm going to hand it over to you to go over the agenda. I'm going to make you presenter. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? I can see it. Okay, fantastic. So, um, should I just go ahead now? Yeah, go for it. Okay, great. So, as Alex said, I'm Mike Punsky, um, and I do load testing, uh, a lot of load testing for a living. Um, with Load Complete and other tools, and um, also a lot of work with the alert site console and monitoring of uh, various networks. In today's agenda for 301, I want to talk about exporting test results. Um, the thing about exporting test results is not everybody wants to use the data that was generated by a load test report in the same way or report on it the same way. By giving you the ability to S export your test results, you have then the ability to pull that into any other third-party tool or even a spreadsheet or whatever you want and be able to dissect that information in whatever way suits you best. So we'll go over how to do that. Um, we'll also talk about testing in multiple environments. By that I mean a lot of times uh, some companies have three environments. There'll be the development environment, there'll be staging, and there'll be production. Um, some companies post things directly to production, not a great idea, but it happens. And then others have maybe just one or two environments um, that they put things into for testing purposes. Um, 
one of the things that low complete gives you the ability to do is very easily take your scenario that you record in one environment and then by changing one thing that completely changes the test to run in the environment that you want. So for example, let's say you were testing uh, in staging.smartbear.com and you wanted to then go and test production. All you have to do is go to one place within the tool and change that domain and then all of your tests will be set to run in production instead of um, in staging. And that's very handy. Uh, some tools don't make it very easy for you to do that and other tools will require you to re-record from scratch. So anything to make it easier is what Low Complete's all about. And then finally, um, the final thing that we want to talk about is customizing your scenarios using operators. Um, this is something that's relatively new to Low Complete. I would say no more than a year and a half to two years ago, operators got added in. And not all of the operators that you see now were there initially. And what this is, is even though in Load Complete you don't have to do any coding and everything can be done by recording and then manipulating things in the UI, there are times when you're going to want to do some things that are uh, a little bit different and require some special logic. And that's what these operators can do for you. Things like you know, a loop. You can just drop that into your scenario in the right spot and you have a loop set up, um, giving you the ability to repeat a certain part of your scenario many or a few times, depending on the logic. But um, these are all things that we'll go over. So, as I was saying, the first thing I want to talk about is exporting test results. So we know why we want to do it. Let's talk about how we get there. Um, exporting your request data is done to either a CSV or XML, and it's very, very simple to do. Um, in the Project Explorer, you just need to go in and find the test result that you want to export, and then open your details item. As you know, each, um, each report or set of results is broken into two separate items. One is the report and one is details. Details is more the raw data than report, which is the raw data turned into a nice human readable format with charts and having everything set up in a nice, easily readable way. Um, but what were the details item? And then once you open the details item, there is a toolbar above it, and you would just click to export to CSV. You tell the, you know, you tell the dialog where you want that CSV to appear, and then your results are exported. Um, very, very simple. Exporting the test results to other formats, there are two other formats that you want to think about here, and that is XML and XML tree. Um, I guess plain XML might be the one that most people want to see um, and would find that easier to use. Um, but if you have something that's looking for an XML tree, that format is supported as well. And once again, it's a very simple matter to go up to the toolbar in the details uh, panels toolbar, go up there and click on export to XML, or you can also um, click to export to XML tree, and you get the same dialogue asking where you want to put it. Now, that being said, talking about it isn't quite the same as seeing it done, 
So I'm just going to very quickly bring this up and I'll show you. Here's a project that I created. I can go into the details. Expand this. So you see that here's here's the report view and see it's you have that nice readable format. You go down to details and you get more of the we we'll call it raw data. So what you want to do if you want to export this is go to the top. Here's your toolbar. And right here you'll see export results to CSV. And here you see export it to XML tree. And if you look right next to that in the middle, you'll see export to plain XML format. And, and as we were saying, it's a very simple matter to click on CSV. You can, you have a choice. You don't have to export everything. If you're only interested in the things that went wrong, that you can then go in and make um, some remediations for in the application. Um, you might want to export only the errors and warnings. Um, or if you want to do some analysis to figure out exactly where the problems were, that might be the way to go. Or if you're looking at something that will give you a better overall picture of the entire test, you might want to export all items. So I'll click there. Then all you have to do is give it a name. Um, I'll call this just CSV and save it. And now it's been saved to um, my documents directory, and it's called csv.csv. Very similar, if I come in and export it to XML, you can ex export all items. Doesn't get much easier than that. So, this really makes it easy to uh, integrate with other tools that you might want to use for reporting. And I'll come back in and Ooh, hold on a second. My, oh, okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Just a little confusion on my part. So that's that's pretty easy to do. Um, if you want to test in multiple environments, so why? First of all, why would you want to test in multiple environments? And we did discuss that a little bit. But a lot of times, what you're going to do is you're going to test something in staging. And then you want, you're going to want to run the same test at some point in production. And why would you want to run it in both? Well, the sad fact is staging is not often an accurate representation of production. Um, first of all, there may be some code that's a little bit different between those two environments. Something may not have uh, been promoted into production at some point. Uh, so you may have some slight differences that you're going to want to check. The other thing is a lot of companies don't want to go through the expense and effort of creating a staging environment that is a 100% accurate representation of production. If you're going to spend money, uh, they feel it should be spent in production, getting that um, as strong and scalable as possible and then leaving staging just for running some sort of functional tests. Um, you may have a single application server and a single database server in staging, and then in production you may have clusters of those. So a lot of times what you come up with when you're testing in staging is more of a functional test than an accurate representation of how your application is going to perform in production. Therefore, a lot of people, a lot of companies will actually test their production site um, you know, at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning so that they impact their customers at least 
and then find out exactly how things are performing. So to do this, SmartBear has created a host list panel in the scenario editor. And then Loduply automatically adds servers to that list during the scenario recording. So while you're recording a test, and, and I can speak for this portion of it um, with a little bit of authority, is a lot of, for example, retail sites um, might have as many as 100 or more hosts represented just on the home page. Um, there are things like uh, social media, ad servers, analytics servers, um, the list goes on and on, partners. Um, there might be as many as 15 different ad servers that are represented there. There may be um, three or four different analytics engines. And you don't always want to test all of those things, so they're going to show up in the hostless panel. But what is really cool about the hostless panel is that in addition to being able to turn on and off hosts, you can modify a host. So you're going to have a recorded host and then the host as it's played back. So you might have staging.smartbear.com as the recorded host, and you would just go over and say, you know, instead of staging.smartbear.com, I want to change that to be www.smartbear.com. And everywhere that staging.smartbear.com appears in your scenario, it will be changed to be www. Doesn't get a lot easier than that. And an even better part about that is if you want to go back to using the original staging, just remove that entry. It's very, very simple to do. So here's a picture of the host list, and you'll see that quite a few different hosts get pulled in when you're recording, and, and here they are. And you have a recorded host, and simulated host. And initially, recorded and simulated are exactly the same. All you have to do here to go from smartbear.com to, let's say, staging.smartbear.com is just click on this entry in the simulated host, and then it gives you the ability to edit it. And so you would just change this to staging.smartbear.com. And if you wanted to remove it later on, you could either you could just change it back. It's very, very simple to do. The final thing that we want to talk about today is using load complete operators. So as I was saying, load complete operators give you a little bit of flexibility in your scenarios. Um, there are lots of different things and different ways that you might want to run your scenario. And if you don't, without these operators, your tests are pretty static. So, for example, page. Yes, when you're recording your scenario, you're, you're creating pages. But what if, let's say, for example, you were testing uh, a rich internet application where everything is updating on the same page. There may not be page breaks where you want them or there may not be enough because you may want to break your uh, script down into logical sections that describe what you're doing at that time. Uh, as an example, let's say you have a page up that um, is a schedule and by entering something on the page, everything else changes. You may want to put another page in right where that change occurs to show that you're making the change. That way, when you run your test, you'll be able to have all of those 
functionalities or actions that take place um, during your recording be accurately represented and called out within the reports makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot and find bottlenecks when you know exactly where those things are happening. And it's a very simple matter within Load Complete to use these. Um, if you go back and take a look here where we just were, you'll see that you have the host list tab at the very bottom, and that's what we were talking about. But right next to it is the operation repository. And if you click on that tab, what you're presented with is this list of operators. All you have to do is grab one of these with your mouse, drag it into your scenario, being careful to place it in the right spot, and it will just work for you. There might be a little bit of configuration that you have to do, but there'll be a window open that shows you the things that you can change and the values that you can enter. Next thing is a rendezvous point. And what a rendezvous point is, is it's a place where everybody gathers, and by everybody I mean the virtual users in your test, where they'll all bunch up and wait until everybody arrives before moving forward. What this gives you the ability to do is normally when you run a load test, you're going to start out with one user or some small number of users and then build up to a larger number over a period of time. And then you're going to hold that for a certain period of time. And then you'll draw it down at the end. But what if, what if you wanted everybody to come into your application staggered that same way. Um, you start with one user, after a second you had another one, now you have two users, after three seconds you have three users. But at some point you, you have a question about the ability of your search uh, feature within your application to be, in, to be able to handle a lot of searches occurring at the same time. All you would do is drop this rendezvous point into the script right before you would push the button in search. And what happens is, even though all of these users are coming in and building up over time, when they get to the rendezvous point, they sort of march in place and wait for every virtual user to get to that point. If you have 2,000 virtual users, and it takes 20 minutes to get up to 2,000, they'll all be waiting at that point in the script. And then when they're all there, they all move forward together. So you, the effect is you have them all come in. They're doing different things at different times until they get to the rendezvous point. And then the crowd of virtual users does the same thing at the same time, and you're able to find out whether your search can actually handle that. Um, so that can be very useful in very specific circumstances. Group gives you the ability to logically group some requests together. If allows you to add conditional logic. So by putting if into your scenario, you could be testing a certain variable to see if you know, it was enough. So let's say the quantity for a certain item on your web page was zero. You may not want to continue. You just may want to end at that point and say, sorry, we don't have enough product uh, to be able to run this test properly. Uh, or any other thing that you want to put in there. But this gives you the ability to put that conditional logic in place. You could also have a while loop or a normal regular loop. Um, with, with this loop here, you might say, uh, I want you to loop 300 times. And then it would just exit the loop at the end of that, um, when it reaches that number. While may just continue looping until a certain condition is met. 
You also have the ability to manually set the value of a variable in your test, and that you can do here. And then the next one is very, very powerful, but you just have to really understand the way things work in the tool to make sure that you're using it properly. And that one is call scenario. What call scenario gives you the ability to do is call out to another scenario from within the first scenario. And what's powerful about this is you could modularize your testing. So for example, if all of your testing is based on the same application and everybody that comes to that application has to go to the home page first, then do the login, and then they would do various other things. What you could do is create one scenario that just does the login and record that once and be able to use it in all of your other tests. So in your other tests, you would make a call out to the login scenario and it would do all of the logic to do a login to the application. Why that is powerful is if, let's say, you had 300 different scenarios that you were running against your application and something changed in the way that you log into the application, you would have to go back to 300 different scenarios and re-record them if you didn't have the ability to call scenario. Because you have the ability to call scenario, all you have to do is re-record that login logic once. And now every other scenario that calls that would be automatically updated. So huge, huge time saver. Delay. Um, beyond the normal think times, you may want to add a delay. You could add a delay in the middle of a page instead of just at the, at the think time at the beginning. Um, depends on what you want to do. You have the ability to put delays into it. You can also put a stop and stop that um, scenario from executing. And you can do a break, which would get you out of any of these loops. Um, under certain circumstances, you may want to end something prematurely, and break is the way to do that. So like I said, it's very simple. All you do is, let's bring up complete, and let's bring up our scenario. I'll switch over to operation repository. And here we have homepage, blog, and contact us. If I wanted to add a page, for example, I can just drag it up and boom, we have another page. Um, you could then add, if you wanted to move your requests around, you could take this request under blog and move it up to being on the other one. Whatever you wanted to do, you have the ability to move things around and create new pages. Um, if you wanted to put a rendezvous point in, uh, in your scenario and then have everybody wait before going to the contact us screen, it would be a simple matter of bringing this up and placing it here. If you have any logic that goes along with some of these, that would be over here on um, this panel for the operation editor. If you wanted to put in you know, a call scenario, you can put that in here, and then when you go to call scenario, the scenario that you're calling would be defined here. And we don't have one that we can call because we only have the single scenario here. But this is where you would place that scenario. Um, delays, the same thing, stops and breaks. It's just a matter of dragging them up and putting them into your scenario. As I said, very simple. Um, it looks like we've actually, we're about 15 minutes ahead of schedule here. Um, so 
I think what I'd like to do at this point is open it up to questions a little bit early and, and see what questions you have about what we've gone over today. Okay, I have one question here that says, according to your experience, given that one or more pages included in the test scenario may change in the course of the project uh, development, do you think it is more beneficial to have several single monolithic end-to-end -end test scenarios and re-record and re-parameterize them when needed or to have test scenarios combined using call scenario operators? I think it's definitely, it depends on your circumstance. If you're running a lot of very simple uh, recordings, it may be just as easy for you to go back in and re-record them. Um, a lot of times, you don't have to do any man manual correlations. Um, if you're doing parameterization, on the other hand, and there are correlations that have to take place um, manually, it, it's definitely a good idea to use um, sub-scenarios to go through there. Um, you, you don't want, you want to repeat as, uh, as little of your uh, recording as possible. You, you really, don't want to do more work than absolutely necessary. Um, let's see. Maybe I can. Not really sure how to pop this out. I want to. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. So there are a few more questions. <coughs> okay. I'm just having a hard time exposing these questions in the panel on go to meeting. Um, yeah, I can't really see the questions except one line at a time. All right. Which one do you want? Which one are you on? Uh, it was asked by Alex and... All right, so the most recent ones. Okay, yeah. so I'll read. So there's two from Alex. All right, so there is one that says, that starts, according to your experience, given that one or more pages included in the test scenario may change in the course of the project development. Did, did you answer that one? Yeah, I did. Okay, all right, here's the next one. All right, one more question. In the course of development, a set of requests sent from the page may change. Can you share any useful and effective approach um, except re-recording scenario for every new build to guarantee that the set of requests in the test scenario still corresponds to the set of requests generated by the current version of the web page? Yeah, unfortunately, no. <laughs> um, that is, is definitely a problem. Um, with all load testing tools, unless you have a load testing tool um, that does everything in an actual browser, what's happening is you're not executing the page each time. You're repeating the requests that were made during the original recording. So even if you go in and change the logic on the page, the, the load test script is going to be playing back the logic as it was when it was recorded. Um, now, normally, that is going to cause an error to occur, 
I can certainly see that there might be some circumstances where it would not cause an error to be visible, um, and you could you could be testing old logic um, even though that has changed on the page. So unfortunately, my answer is when in doubt, re-record. Uh, and I have to do that myself all the time. And sometimes I'll re-record if I even have the slightest doubt that everything is exactly the same as when it was recorded. Um, also, because of doing a lot with alert site monitoring, I can speak for the fact that over the course of time, there are little changes that will occur in your application, and you may not think it's anything that would affect your testing, but even very, very minor changes add up. Uh, over the course of time, and you could be getting invalid results by not doing um, a re-record. So like I said, unless it's actually being rendered in a browser fresh each time, uh, if, you're just, if you're playing back the requests that were made in the original recording, um, those requests may no longer be valid, uh, and you do need to do that re-record. Do you see any more questions, Alex? Let me double check. Nope, no questions. Okay, if anybody has any additional questions, now's a great time to ask them. Or um, alternatively, you know, contact information should be on the slides. Um, you can either contact um, Alex or myself after. Um, this class if you have any questions and be more than willing to get those answered for you. Yep, I am putting um, an email address you guys can reach out to in the chat box. Okay, fantastic. There we go. Okay, then. If there are no other questions now, um, I think we're good to go. All right. Awesome. Thank you all for attending, and thank you, Mike, for presenting. This is a great class. Um, a, you know, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out, and please take the exit survey on your way out. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone.